Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good night. Uh, so thank you all that uh, are here today for a new uh, IEEE CAS uh, Revenue do Sul Talk 2021. As you can see now, today we have uh, Professor Pierre Emmanuel Gallardon from uh, University of Utah in USA. So thank you very much, Pierre Emmanuel, for accepting our invitation and to talk today about this very interesting subject. We have also here Professor Fernando Moraes from the Catholic University of, uh, of Rio Grande do Sul at Porto Alegre, that will be the session chair today. Uh, but today we are here for uh, the talk of Professor Pierre Emmanuel Gallardon, talking about under the hood of Open FPGA. And uh, then I now give the word to Professor Fernando Moraes from the Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul at Porto Alegre to do the uh, presentation of uh, Pierre Emmanuel Gallardon. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, welcome, Pierre Manuel. So, Pierre Manuel Gallardon is a state professor in electrical and computer engineering department of the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. He holds a PhD degree in electrical engineering from Celle Tigre France and the University of Lyon, France. Prior to joining the University of Utah, he was a research associate at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, EPFL. Professor Gayon received several awards from NSF, IEEE, DARPA, and ACM. He is a senior member of the IEEE. Welcome, Pierre Manuel. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the kind introduction and, and the great invitation to, uh, uh, to, to present uh, the work my lab has been doing uh, around the Open FPGA framework. Um, I believe the slides are not live yet. Excellent, thank you. So, um, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the Open FPGA framework with a talk entitled Under the Hood of Open FPGA. So first of all, let me let me start by asking the question of why Open FPG. Well, I'm not going to uh, explain again what FPGAs are, but FPGAs are essential to a modern high performance computing system. Uh, not only they are found in many uh, uh, industrial, defense, IoT uh, application, but they're also ubiquitous in wired and wireless communication, audio, video, broadcasting, data centers, and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, the, um, however, there is more and more demand for domain specific application, uh, that would get some use or good use of any, uh, specific types of uh, computing resources of, uh, of FPGAs. Um, I like to give the example of, uh, AI applications, right? Where, um, uh, AI is typically DSP hungry. However, Commercial FPGAs are tailored for being general purpose and may not fully capture, uh, may not fully able to perform at their best uh, in some, you know, uh, specific domains. So this is, uh, so basically there's a need to, uh, having the ability to create uh, new FPGA fabrics in a very uh, agile way. However, this is an extremely cumbersome process. To give you an illustration from whatever requirements one might have, uh, you need typically a, a, a large team of senior architects, people with deep, you know, domain knowledge about FPG architectures to come up with new fabrics and then having an army of hardware and software engineers executing towards those specifications to end up with a year-long process in providing you with the complete production-ready layout as well as all the supporting CAD tools. Well, here, the prospect is different, and we want to be extremely transformative. What we want to do is to enable a single person, an architect, with a clever ID, with the help of our framework, to be able to create complete production-ready GDS, so ready for tape-out, and the supporting CAD tool in less than a day. It's a bold statement. There's a lot of things to be done there but we already have been able to achieve uh, a certain uh, impressive milestones. In particular, 
were able to have complete FPG and EFPG generations. We demonstrated that with four tape outs in 2020, we're at three tape outs this year already with a reduced team of students. We also are capable of supporting um, modern architectures that are fully customizable. We support more than 100 plus architectures in our uh, test infrastructure, ranging from uh, small FPGAs like Lattice Ice 40 all the way up to more complex fabric like 7 Series Xinix FPGAs. We um, have a lot of strong optimization for fast physical design, uh, <clears throat> which is the key of the platform here. We're designing you know, mid-range fabrics, 150K to 100K LUTs, only requires 24 hours. So this is one of the key uh, prospects of OpenFPGA. And now I'd like to dig into some more, more details and try to understand what is actually OpenFPGA. So OpenFPGA is a complete framework that, on the one hand, <clears throat> provides chip designing capabilities. That's what we call the FPGA prototyping flow. Not like it's not only prototyping, it can be production as well, but that's all the chip design, fabricating, manufacturing, and FPGA. And, and for that, our open FPG engine uses some high-level description languages, bind to standard cells and custom cell libraries, and is capable of spitting out netlist that goes to place and route, as well as complete uh, test bench strategies for um, pre-silicon sign-off. But in addition to that, we also have the complete end user flow that is supported. Because once you have an FPGA, you need to be able to implement a circuit on it and generate the configuration bitstream for that to be useful for, uh, for your end user. So this is also fully supported on the, um, um, on, on the FPGA end user side. Now, however, what I represented right here is uh, typically um, what, what people would do to support FPGA. This is resembling the, the CIMB flow infrastructure that is uh, architect around the VTR framework from the University of Toronto and is capable of generating bit streams to, uh, to many different fabrics. What we try to do is that instead of having a clear separation between the two, we are in fact working on a single code base. Uh, this is one of the key elements of the OpenFPGA technology. As I said before, FPGAs are typically designed where you have a hardware team and a software team. What we're trying to do is to scratch this model and only have a software-oriented approach. So what we do, in fact, is that we have a core infrastructure that is derived from the uh, exploration um, and, and uh, end-user support uh, ecosystem, with, in particular, the tool Yosis from Yosis HQ and Claire Wolf, as well as the VPR framework from the University of Toronto and, and Von Betts maintaining that. These two core technologies are extremely popular to do FPG exploration. What we do is that we enhance that architecture by providing the ability to generate from that core duo complete, very large representations of FPG fabrics that can then be fed into a floor planning, feed through generation, physical design enhancements, basically to implement the structure. We also enhance that by generating design constraints for implementing powerful and, and high-performance fabrics, test bed generators for verification, as well as the FPGA bitstream for the FPGA programming. So as you can see, we do not have at all uh, two separate tools. In fact, it's a single code base that provides you the chip design flow capabilities alongside with the end user design flow. And that is a very powerful paradigm because it helps us generating architectures that can only be supported by the software. You never end up in a situation where there are clever ideas from the hardware that are very difficult to handle from a software perspective. So that's really the crux here in, in supporting all of that in a unified platform. Now, I just mentioned that we are using architecture descriptions, but how customizable can our, our architecture be? Well, here's a typical, very broad overview of what we can have, of what we do, as a matter of fact. So we use um, a high-level description language that is XML-based. Uh, we took inspiration from uh, the language uh, design and used by uh, VPR, 
for architecture exploration. And we enhance that to provide additional instructions to our system to know how the fabric should be implemented. Let me give you some examples there. Um, this is the representation of an heterogeneous FPG fabric that you have right here. Inside of the FPG fabric, you have tiles with switch blocks, connection box, configurable logic blocks, within which you do end up with you know, fairly complex fracturable structures eventually with multiple four input plots and whatnot. So what happens here is that our um, language helps you define what blocks you have in the different elements. So for example, here we do uh, instruct the tool to use uh, a flip-flop that is a high-speed flip-flop.v that binds to a given standard cell library or some custom cells. In addition to that, we also have um, uh, capabilities for the tool to auto-generate architectures. If I dig into just this basic logic element to give you a, a stronger understanding of what I mean, well, we do have some uh, constructs that help you tell the tool what you are expecting to have. And the tool will be auto-generating the, um, the, the end result or the end architecture you're looking for. So for example, right here, we say we have a multiplexer. OK, this is great. But we want this multiplexer to uh, use a one-level structure. And we want this uh, one-level structure to have some input buffers um, implemented using some inverter x1 and no output buffers, for example. Your, uh, therefore, your OpenFPG infrastructure will generate the proper netlist using the proper set of cells that will implement this type of architecture. So it's somehow intent-driven. You express what your intention is for your various blocks, and the tool auto-generates uh, what needs to be implemented there. On the other end, you can also provide complete user-defined blocks. For example, this is a flip-flop that helps you bind to an element that you have crafted yourself whether it is a custom cell or whether it is a bigger block, such as a DSP element, for instance. <clears throat> the strategy of using these descriptions is to be able to generate what I call post-technology map, post-tech map netlists. We know how to implement an FPG fabric. We instruct the tool how we want our structure to be. The tool simply automates this process. We do not let the tool go completely um, uh, independent and, and synthesize the architecture for you because you want to control what the structure is going to be. Okay, now modern FPGAs are actually more complicated than just having an LUT. They usually uh, implement what, are, what is called multi-mode CLBs. So you have a given structure, but depending on how you use that structure, it could be implemented as a six input LUT, multiple four input LUTs, multiple five input LUTs, shift registers, you name it. So what we had to come up with is a notion of physical implementation or physical views, which represents the complete implementation of our blocks. That is used, of course, for fabric generation. But then we also are capable to provide operating modes that are subsets of those physical views that are used to instruct the end user tool how to properly bind a given primitive to the physical block. In other words, if you find a netlist that contains a six input LUT, how should you use that block? Or if you have a netlist that contains multiple four input LUTs, how should you use that block? Well, so now from there, you'll get the ID. These operating modes are virtual views, virtually reduced views of the CLBs with existing binding between the physical view and the operating mode view. So we have that for you know, arithmetic modes, we have that for independent LUT modes, and so on and so forth, depending on the modes of operation you have in your uh, elements. So now going back to uh, the initial view, just still representing chip designer and FPG user to, to simplify the thing, even though you fully understood that we are based on the same uh, code base, this Framework is actually compatible with many of the existing tools you have for chip design verification and so on and so forth. Indeed, what we do is that the um, OpenFPG generates very log net lists, place and route scripts, design constraints, and it is designed to interface gracefully with existing uh, ASIC design uh, tools such as Synopsys ICC2, Cadence Innovus, or OpenRoad, if you want to go completely open source. 
Uh, we do support the three backends already. We have Tata chips with these uh, three backends and, um, and, and keep improving and maintaining compatibility with all of that. On the sign off front, we do have uh, multiple um, also supports for HDL simulator as well as formal tools, both from the open source and the um, uh, closed source front. And um, sorry, and then last but not least, I'd like to mention what uh, technologies have been validated with uh, with the approach. Um, so we have validated uh, ASAP 7, GF12, 130, TSMC 40, 180, Skywater 130. Uh, that is an open source PDK, but we also made a few more recently, UMC22, TSMC22, and so on and so forth. So that's also one of the key aspects of the OpenFPG framework, is that it is very graceful and easy to move from a process and a tech node to another one. It requires a little bit of effort, obviously, but it's not at all comparable to um, what had to be done in the past with uh, complete redesign of the, of the IPs. So... <clears throat> This framework basically makes FPGA fabric design a similar type of effort than designing an, an ASIC. And that's, the, that's the, the gist of it. So now, of course, even though I may disclaim that we can design FPGAs like ASICs, well, there are many differences when it goes to physical design. <coughs> if you want to have high performance fabrics, you need to come up with uh, specific technologies. And let me show you what we had to implement in our system. Uh, so FPGAs are usually uh, extremely regular. Uh, they are using an island style uh, architecture. So I'm just representing here an homogeneous uh, FPGA architecture for which you only have the same block, the same tiles containing your logic blocks and switch boxes and stuff uh, that are replicated. This can easily be extended to heterogeneous architecture with BRAMs, DSPs, our methodology supports all of that. It's just to simplify the, the process here. But as you can see, we do have the same blocks repeated over and over. So um, how do we handle that? Well, we handle that through um, a hierarchical design flow. Uh, it is not novel. Multi-level hierarchical flows are well supported in modern EDA tools, right? for which you basically look at the top level you do your design planning phase, you identify what are the key elements you want to design, you have your uh, floor planning, design shaping, and so on and so forth that instructs the tool where the pins should align and that, that kind of things. And then you move to individual modules, PNR, you stitch them together and you do the top level PNR. This is, um, this is typical uh, for modern uh, ASIC tooling, however, there is um, a problem along that road. The problem is that the standard hierarchical flow does not work great for FPGAs. The main reason is that in an FPGA, you end up very quickly, if you go back to my representation, right, showing you the, the tiles, you end up very quickly with a lot of individual modules you have to handle. So you have a number of um, you have a module explosion happening here. And in addition to that, you also have very stringent channel routes, especially for your top level clock. So if you look at this uh, at this plot right here, this is a runtime that we that we got uh, using a standard hierarchical flow. And you can see that well, things work pretty good when you make uh, toy examples, but uh, it doesn't scale well. You know, moving from 40 lots to 2,000 lots, 2,000 lots is ridiculously small, right? But it already takes a much longer time, and it, it's an exponential growth, essentially. So while it is fast for prototyping, it does not scale well to any of the large fabrics. So we have to address some of those runtime bottlenecks and understand what can be done. The main runtime bottlenecks happen here and there. At the design planning phase, the number of instances uh, increases quadratically with the FPGA grid size, right? Moving from a two by two to a 16 by 16 fabric, boom, you just increase quadratically the number of elements you have to deal with. So boundary analysis and pin placement creates uh, large concerns. At the top level, stitch stitching things, ensuring clock tree is going to all the modules gracefully and, and being improved is also creating a major uh, hurdle. So 
how did we address this challenge? We addressed this challenge by pre-planning and using the symmetries of FPGAs. The first thing we do is that uh, we moved away from a notion where we have a uh, top level PNR. This is key. So if you look at this figure, you can see that, well, if you have a two by two fabric, we identified with different colors, what are the unique modules? And you see that in fact, if you look at the tile structure that um, is using, um, you know, the connection boxes as well as the switch box, that tile just repeats no matter where you go in your fabric. So technically, what you want to do is to get, um, you want to make a complete design flow with the smallest possible fabric that uses all the individual modules. And then you want to uh, scale things up with a top level Lego assembly. Really top level Lego assembly where all the blocks very nicely and gracefully abuse one to the other. So you can um, uh, skip most of the top level PNR hurdles. So that's what we do. So we try to look at what are the smallest FPG sizes containing all the modules that can be reused for bigger designs and move from there. In order to allow that, to allow this graceful planning, we need to consider um, the power grid. So we need to create a highly regular power grid um, that will make sure that every time you move from one block to another, you repeat exactly the same pattern. So it needs to be highly repeatable across the height and width of the fabric on both sides. So the power planning is very different. Power planning needs to be accounted not only because of your power expectations, but also because of the capabilities of your technology, your design kits, to know what are the uh, what is the spacing you need to respect between your various um, uh, top level power grid distribution and so on and so forth. So power grid needs to be adjusted in, in such a regular and graceful way. You also need to start thinking about global signals. Well, while these two blocks are indeed identical, these blocks receive the same signal, the same reset or clock or you know load, programming clocks, whatever that is, right? So if you look about what you have, you have a couple of top level signals that need to be distributed to multiple blocks, either to all the logic blocks or to all the individual blocks. And in order to support that, you have to account for it at the pre-planning phase with the notion of feed-through ports. Feed-through ports are actually designed such that if you look at what you have right here in this uh, um, um, uh, connection box uh, in the Y direction, you have some signals coming in, doing some stuff inside of the block and coming out of the block to feed the next one. So you need to consider those feed through, you know, with uh, inputs from the West going to the various other sides of the block. So once you have things, everything will be able to be propagated nicely through your infrastructure. So we have to do this pre-routing of the global signals. We also have to do a very advanced um, pre-planning as well as precising of the clock routing. So if you look at the clock, uh, there are a few complexities, right? So having a clock is uh, no easy job, right? You need to handle the, uh, of course, H3, uh, getting good latency and skew. And so that requires having multiple uh, levels of, um, of planning. So this is level two, going to level one, level zero, right? So you need to look at hierarchies and, and what metals are going to be used for your different levels. All of that happens with custom methodologies we developed for the OpenFPGA framework that is outside of any of the physical design uh, tools that typically exist. So the trick with clock is that because of the latency and skew requirements, you need to think now of not only feed throughs, but buffered feed throughs. because so the signals are critical. So you need to be able to handle properly some of the, um, you basically need to be able to handle properly all your uh, logical effort requirements between the blocks and what it feeds through. So now bundling all of those techniques, you can see a major runtime improvement and scalability capabilities of the complete infrastructure. So now this is uh, again, the same plot I showed you before, but now 
with increased size complexities. And what you can see is that, uh, so first of all, the top level assembly allowed to completely cut the uh, time required for uh, the, uh, you know, uh, for the pin assignments and feed through generations. There's still, of course, a little bit of <coughs> time increase linked with the size of netlists. Um, but then, you know, everything boils down to final sign of verification at the top level and so on and so forth. So if you look at what we have, it means that you have a complete system capable of 164 um, K LUTs in less than 24 hours. It's been improved since then even further. Things do scale uh, extremely well with uh, fabrics, you know, with uh, 200K and plus uh, LUT, so modern FPG fabrics. It's an illustration right there of an actual complete layout of 120 by 128 fabric, 164K layout. And you can see it's very, very tiny, but you see the tile that is just one of those super small elements right here. I do not have that in this slide, but this approach also enabled us to have a uh, very scalable latency and skew and, and make sure that clock distributions are proper even for large fabric sizes. So now it's not only enough to have pre-planning and design, um, um, yeah, pre-planning and, and design shaping. What you need to do is to properly constrain your working flow, either constraining your place and route tools, or also finding methodology and constraints for performing static timing analysis to your system. So a key element also of OpenFPG, in addition to this very log generation and tickle and methodology generation, is the SDC generation, so design constraint for physical design and benchmarking. So what happens here? Well, a quick illustration of, again, a CLB. Well, when you give you know, um, your backend tool the, the block that you want to be designed, you need to uh, properly provide all the various timing arc constraints so your tool can perform at implementing the desired um, performance. So that works OK. Then one can move to the full fabric right, using the methodology I just showed you. But from there, how do you evaluate the performance of your system? That is one of the highest complexities of FPGAs. FPGs are full of combinational loops, right? You know, you can implement whatever you want. You're never going to implement a design with combinational loop at the end. But if you give your unprogrammed fabric, all those loops may exist. How do you instruct ASIC tools that hate uh, combinational loops to perform properly? We do that through, again, um, constraints. So from the fabric, you can get your full reports, path, and so on and so forth. And we want to perform architecture timing analysis. So what we do is that we provide a first set of timing constraints that will only help us study some of the timing arcs without generating uh, combinational loops in the system. So you basically generate a bunch of false path um, requirements. So you just extract only timings from point A to point B with the timing arc you're looking for. So you can do that across your fabric, get you know, statistics, um, of, um, um, statistics of the performance in the system, and, and so on and so forth. But now, in addition to know what your silicon would look like, how much performance can we get on the fabric? You can do a bunch of simulation, but what you can also do is use static timing analysis by generating, implementing benchmarks on the fabric, getting the bitstream, and generating an SDC file that contains all the various timing arcs from the fabric. And that way you can also extract what the performance is going to be from a, a snake you know, distribution inside of your fabric and telling you, this is the level of performance I get for a convolution 2D, for uh, um, a RISC-V processor, and so on and so forth. All right. Now, the best achievement so far, OpenFPGA is silicon proven. We take out four chips last year. Um, the first one I want to highlight is a frog test chip, uh, which is a 12 nanometer global foundry test chip, relatively small in terms of fabric size, but fully instrumented and implementing modern logic elements architecture resembling seven series Xilinx FPGAs. 
Um, this chip was uh, received, packaged on uh, BGA substrates, uh, tested, and, uh, and is functional. Um, in addition to that, uh, we taped out a few um, EFPGA or FPGA SOCs. Um, we did that through the Google and eFabless program um, uh, that are the origin of, of Team Ensel from Google, who kindly invited us to, to participate. In, the, um, um, in this program, we have taped out three types of architecture with three different variations. Um, they are including an FPGA fabric alongside with a RISC-V processor um, with different complexities and different blocks. What is quite remarkable here is that this 12 nanometer tape out was our first uh, test chip that we did. It was about a two and a half person month type of effort. While the um, SOFA architectures uh, represented a one person month effort, three chips, with three engineers um, over a month-ish was required to implement the complete system, design, sign off, tape out. Last but not least, I'd like to provide a, a quick um, note about the end-to-end -end EDA support. As I told you guys, we are using, um, we're based around the VPR tool chain. So that means we have complete open source Verilog to Bitstream support for our end users. Um, in addition to just supporting that, I'd like to point out one of the sisters projects of OpenFPGA currently running in my lab, LS Oracle, which is a, a no human in the loop logic synthesizer. We all know how complicated it is to generate good quality RTL, right? And we all know how FPG designers tend to sometimes cut corners when it goes to timing constraints and, and quality of RTL implementation. LS Oracle is a framework that enables no human in the loop interaction. Put your RTL in, LS Oracle does the job for you in giving you the best uh, system. So it is using, of course, a few design constraints, unifying synthesis scripts, and AI and machine learning to provide you with the best possible outcome. So this end-to-end -end EDS support is natively built into the system and um, you do not need to bother about creating your own EDA tool chain. It is there for all the fabrics generated by OpenFPGA. And from here, uh, this is also supported by a uh, community. So there is a very large um, you know, support and general um, uh, community living around all of those efforts. All right. Now from there, uh, I'd like to highlight just a few pickled recent feature enhancement inside of the FPGA, inside of the open FPGA infrastructure. So you get also uh, a better gist of what we have been up to in the past uh, few months. So first of all, there has been complete code reconstructions. Uh, um, uh, the engines are written in C++20. We have a shell-like interface resembling in some ways TCL interface. We're going to keep working on that to make full TCL support as well as Python APIs. But um, uh, everything makes things in a fairly uniform way uh, using the VPR8 engine and all the architecture support that goes with that. Uh, fairly large build compatibilities, but more importantly, uh, we're really using, even though it's open source hardware, we're really using the software methodologies with continuous integration, 100 plus regression tests. Every time there is a bug, we add a new regression test, so we are sure that we can you know, keep producing a high quality environment. What is most notable is recent performance increased. Um, you know, things got reconstructed to improve, you know, to enable better runtime, lower peak memories to support, you know, mid-range uh, FPGA class uh, with, uh, with a high quality, small runtime and small peak memories. Uh, so this is going well. There's still, of course, uh, further improvement that could be added, but it is already in a, in a very good shape. Uh, I'd like to talk about the shell. So traditionally, OpenFPGA and VPR7 were uh, shell-based. So you have a very large <laughs> you know, command line to launch the tool, which makes things hard to follow. Um, we have moved things uh, scalable to um, uh, a shell structure that can be either interactive, as people do for you know, synopsis, cadence, you know, whatever, when you launch your tool in an interactive command mode line. But we also have a script mode where you can just create and script your various uh, operations. 
making things easy to debug and to customize the flow functionality. Um, <clears throat> I essentially talked about uh, homogeneous uh, fabrics, but we do support completely heterogeneous fabrics as well. Um, you know, we CLB, memory elements, as well as different IO capacities. This is very helpful for EFPGAs, for example, where you can uh, have one side containing a bunch of IOs and other sides without any IOs, for example. Or so you can modulate things between internal IOs and external IOs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll support multi column heterogeneous blocks, right? So you can uh, very easily implement inside of your fabric, even if you fancy uh, a complete risk five processor. So you can, you know, look at, at you know, design shaping your, your structure inside of OpenFPGA the way you see fit. And um, you can also create high performance uh, interfaces on the side of your fabric. This is an example with an AIB interface, chiplet interface, uh, that is this open source standard from uh, Intel and maintained by the chip science. So you can easily create also uh, EFPG chiplets using the OpenFPG infrastructure. One aspect that is usually overlooked when you look at uh, you know, traditional FPGA infrastructure is configuration protocol. Um, programming your FPGA is obviously fundamental, and it's one of the key aspects in addition to physical design techniques I mentioned. We do support four different configuration peripherals that are providing different trade-offs in, in configuration time, physical design, and, and PPA. Um, we have the following four. Standalone basically means that we give access to every single configuration point inside of the FPGA, mostly useful for uh, testing. Configuration chain is what is typically used in low-cost and small-size EFPGAs, where you have a snake-like scan chain going through your circuit to program all your configuration chains. We also have a memory bank organization, word line, bit line, to access all your configuration bits. This is very useful in uh, EFPGAs and FPGAs based on emerging technologies, flash-based, um, RAM-based, that kind of things. And finally, we have what we call the frame-based, which is used in large-size FPGAs. It is basically distributed uh, memory bank decoder style types of architecture, enabling partial reconfiguration and, um, and, and faster uh, multi-head configurations. I will go fairly quick on the next two elements uh, in order not to bother you too much, but um, OpenFPGA supports uh, multi-clocks. Uh, so you can have multi-clock trees, multi-clock domains, um, a programmable, uh, local programmable clock network, and, and so on and so forth. So you can you know, make really um, uh, modern architecture on that front as well to switch from domains to domains. Design for test is one of the fundamental elements if you want to have not only uh, um, the ability to evaluate uh, a test chip that you make, but also guarantee that the uh, this chip can be fully productized. So we support memory element with scan capabilities, so you can easily you know uh, load test vectors, read back test vectors, that kind of things, and um, we do that across the fabric which enable the stability of all the flip-flops. It's implemented in our FPGAs, and it makes things also compatible with uh, automated test methodologies, right? So you can create, uh, you know, ATPG test vectors for your different elements and, and so on and so forth. This is very non-traditional for the FPGA world that typically would craft custom bit streams to, to test the various functionalities. Now one can use standard tooling to also uh, handle that. All right, so now we covered how configurable we could be, right? How customizable, but how, how good in terms of performance can we get? Well, this is another key element of OpenFPGA. OpenFPGA helps you, enables you to use optimized standard cell libraries. Um, the cell library has a strong impact on the FPGA matrix because 90% of an FPGA is made on is made of configuration chain flip-flops and multiplexers. So if you are using flip-flops, DFFs, as well as if you're using you know, fully terminated input and output terminated um, multiplexers, you're going to lose a lot of area and performance. What you want to do is to be able to craft your architecture in such a way that um, 
you make the most used blocks very compact. Here's an example, for example, where we created for a 4 nanometer tech node, um, a T-gate base MOX2 cell that is 2.5 times smaller than the one from the uh, standard cell library, as well as a configuration chain flip-flop that is uh, about you know, 1.8x smaller than a regular DFF. This is a key element to enable compactness of your, of your layout. Um, what I'm showing here is a graph showing the array evaluation at the 40 nanometer technology node for Stratix 4, so Intel PSG Stratix 4 resembling architecture of a CL. Um, I'll, I'll pass on the previous work, right? But OpenFPG already improves a little bit some of the previous work. It's essentially the way we generate our uh, multiplexers, the way we keep things tighter, right, in physical design. But what is the key element here is that one can really use these custom cells to significantly reduce the area of your blocks, bringing you a relatively close in gap compared to a full custom commercial FPGA uh, layout. This can be further bridged, pushing the scripts, pushing the cells. We are currently looking into that, but that's to give you some perspective that, you know, adding a few custom cells already have a very large impact and that the fabrics generated by OpenFPGA are already of high performance or I, I would say um, are cost efficient um, relative to uh, a commercial full custom FPGA. Remember that this kind of layout is generated in one day compared to you know, one year of many engineers to fine tune all the layouts. <clears throat> Performance wise, it is also quite interesting uh, what we're showing here is uh, the performance of the different silicon elements compared to um, uh, previous work as well as commercial products served as a reference right here. Um, we are considering their uh, slow, slow and typical, typical corners. Uh, it is hard to tell which corners are used uh, in the context of a Stratix 4 or like any commercial product as a matter of fact, because uh, it's all uh, it's all a question of speed binning and um, uh, and and taking the margins. Typically, happening in the ASIC world is probably not uh, the most relevant. Anyway, what can be said is that using our system, one can provide one can create a fabric that has nothing to be shy of uh, commercial products. So timing wise, we end up being fairly close to. Um, what is, you know, to what full custom layout can produce. All right. So from there, I'd like to um, generally conclude about the OpenFPGA project and, and briefly look into uh, the future. So OpenFPGA, hopefully, um, you've been able to assess that by yourself. It's one of the leading open source FPGA IP generators. It supports highly customizable architectures. Uh, it has uh, one of the most complete open source EDS supports, and it, uh, it enables high performance fabric generation and 24 hour development cycles to look and evaluate new FPG architectures all the way down to uh, GDS. In order to promote that effort, and as a result of uh, starting to see significant traction around the project and, and FPGs at large, um, Myself, as well as a few industry veterans, uh, such as uh, uh, Navi Chawani, former CEO of Sci5 and current CEO of Rapid Silicon, uh, Brian Face from uh, the CEO of QuickLogic, uh, Von Beth from the University of Toronto, Serge Lee from, from DARPA, Nani Demichelli from EPFL, we all got together and founded the uh, Open Source FPG Foundation. The goal of the Open Source Fund FPG Foundation is to democratize FPG technologies to provide open user focus and collaborative environments. And Open FPGA is now a project under the Open Source Foundation. So you'll tell me actually why, you know, opening a foundation? Well, because I'm a strong believer that technology alone does not guarantee adoption. In fact, what you need to do is to create an ecosystem around that, an ecosystem where, and I highlight just a, a few couple of items Governance is a key aspect, right? We should not be in closed circles. We need to be able to account for requirements that are the most meaningful to other users across the world as well as industrial partners. 
education and training is one of the fundamental aspects. We want to be able to provide training material, training opportunities and educational opportunities all over the world for people interested in FPGA technologies and chip design. I'd like to highlight on that front that uh, OpenFPGA initiated uh, the tape out world um, uh, process for which um, whose goal is to actually partner with uh, local institutions in various countries and, and create tape out opportunities for, for students. It's been extremely successful so far in, uh, in Pakistan, Turkey, uh, it is uh, growing in many other uh, areas as well, and we have chapters uh, uh, growing on that front. Um, please reach out to me, Shall you know, you're interested uh, about that. But again, so technology alone is not, um, does not guarantee adoption. You need to have all of that to support that. And this is what a healthy ecosystem uh, will do. The health ecosystem will guarantee adoption. And I'm actually very happy to uh, mention that a, a week ago or so, uh, QuickLogic Corp actually um, uh, announced uh, the Australis EFPG IP generator, which is their own proprietary version or their own solution to provide EFPG IP that is fully built upon OpenFPGA. So QuickLogic took OpenFPGA. We worked with them for, for months and years um, in adding new features and new support that is part of the open source, but adding their own domain expertise and past expertise in designing complete IPs and productizing IPs, they have been able to create a, a product around OpenFPGA. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll stop my presentation for today and I'll be extremely happy to take any additional questions you might have. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, thanks a lot, Pierre, for, for this uh, nice and interesting talk. Let me see if I have questions. I have not questions for the moment, but I have someone. Uh, I have a question, for example, an important feature required in industrial designs are multiple clock domains. We take, for example, Xilinx or let's say Intel Altero. They have PLLs, DCM, and so on and so forth. You mentioned that often FPJ can support multiple clock domains. Which are the limitations and how you manage this queue, for example, when you have multiple clock domains? <coughs> yes, absolutely. So multi-clock domain is actually <laughs> um, <laughs> is actually a complicated problem, right? I know. Um, <laughs> Because it is a problem that spans uh, the hardware support, right? You need to have multi-clock trees. You need to have uh, multi, you know, ways to select multiple clock sources to your flip-flops, all that kind of things, right? It is, again, very different from ASICs, where you know what your clock domains are. You need, in the hardware of FPG, you need to be able to support everything, right? You need to be able to support the implementation of multi-clock domains in a programmable way. That's one part. The second part will be about the end user tooling, right? And, and supporting, uh, you know, synthesis across multiple clock domains, supporting uh, STA across multiple clock domains, all that kind of stuff. What OpenFPG does support mostly right now is the hardware part. So we're capable of handling multi-clock trees. We're capable of stitching things to multiple PLLs. We're capable of uh, having all the programmable clock routing not at the level of what a modern fabric such as um, Xilinx and Altera uh, do, which is you know having really programmable clock routes. We have fixed clock trees and, and, and selection that can be done at the input of your logic blocks. We do not support you know those notions of a useful skew, for example, for not supporting retiming, that, that kind of things, right? So, so there are some hardware limitations for sure. But already OpenFPJ supports multi-clock trees, PLL stitching, and programmable selection of uh, multi-clock sources to the flip-flops. Software-wise, there is still quite a few things that need to be done. Uh, right now, it is essentially up to the user to create you know, the RTL the proper way with their multi-clocks. And then you feed that into the system, we place it 
to respect that. But that's what we have. Does that so can you have different regions of the system work at different frequencies, for example? That's right. You can make that. You can make the granularity at different regions, like quadrants, for example, or also per column or per CLB basis. So you just, you know, you can think, for example, of um, a, a big FPGA separated in four quadrants. Each quadrant had its own clock tree, clock trees, actually. And then within the clock trees, you can select which clock tree feeds into which CLB. So there is a lot of versatility, but you know, once again, the OpenFPG framework is about uh, generating the architecture you fancy the most for your application, right? Or for your application domain, right? So it is work in progress. We keep adding new features. There you go. Okay. Um, well, I have a second question. Uh, you showed that uh, you have integration, for example, with Risk Five. Yep. Uh, software and also you can make partial reconfiguration in the, in your system so there is a way or some epa for example to run software and on demand change a given accelerator and reconfigure the system for a given accelerator for example let's say i need an accelerator for convolution in machine learning it's possible to, to make in software the selection of a given region of the FPGA and reconfigure it. Absolutely. So I did not provide any slide material for that. I actually removed this slide uh, 30 minutes before the talk, which should, <laughs> probably was not a good move. But we do support, indeed, um, multiple, uh, we call them um, programming heads. So like, you know, instead of having a, a single scan chain you can have multiple scan chains so multiple independent regions for Frames. programming yes so um so we do support that uh that gives you the ability to indeed reconfigure your system right we have as you noted risk 5 and fefpga uh socs what we have not built yet would be the you know top level software support on top of it right because you need you know if you want to support Ideally, you know, accelerators, you need to, you know, uh, open CL kernels and how do you map things? And, you know, it, it adds a, a level of software complexity that is not part of our ecosystem, but we would love to see being developed or contribute to. Let's see, we have some question. We have a, here a question from Ricardo Reis. How difficult it is to adapt OpenFPJ to different types of FPJs? So I assume Ricardo's question is about adapting to, you know, like a small four input LUT FPGA to a complex six input LUT FPGA and or uh, adjusting to a given tech node. That's actually the beauty of OpenFPGA. It is very simple to do that. Um, so to give you numbers, right, adapting from a tech node to another is about... Um, it's a weak type of process to bind all the standard cells, knowing what to do. And it is about, you know, three weeks to adjust physical design scripts and methodologies. So a month to adapt to a completely new process node. For adapt adapting to different FPG types. So first of all, we uh, maintain 100 plus FPG architectures in our repos. So there's, you know, all of them working and fully tested. You can just pick up, pick up the one you prefer and and move with that. But making a, a modification to the FPG architecture, changing the architecture, changing the number of LUTs, all that kind of things, uh, it's typically a day type of process, right? It's modifying things, debugging to make sure that you have not messed up with the syntax, right? The syntax works correctly and not, it does not make anything crash. And from there, push a button and you can get the complete GDS with your actual performance, you know, area and all the PPA numbers at the end of the day. Okay. So it is very easy to move from a tech node and an FPGA type to another. And uh, my last question here is what do you think to have a specialized architecture, for example, for machine learning to accelerate, for example, convolutions or some neural network, <coughs> neural network? This is an excellent question. This is, a, this is actually an excellent question. So let me start with uh, some facts, right? 
So FPGs are extremely uh, popular right now to accelerate machine learning, not only because you can implement custom hardware, but because it distributes DSP and, and RAM. Right, exactly. Right? So it's really a highly distributed architecture. Now, if you look at actually uh, some statistics, most of neural network implementations today on FPGA max out the number of DSPs and RAM blocks. So the scarce resource is not the logic, it is the number of VRAMs and the number of DSPs. With yes. an infrastructure like OpenFPGA, you can craft a domain-specific fabric that will contain more DSPs, more RAM blocks, that will group them close together in order to have some sort of in-memory computing type of things. Exactly. So you can really work with your weights nearby and that kind of stuff, right? So, so you can AI is a perfect example actually on on why domain specific FPGAs do have a, a future because you can actually just tailor that for your problems, class of problems. So yeah, to answer your question, the simplest way, the simplest expression that can be made is just okay. You take up an FPGA, you increase by three times the number of DSP and RAM blocks compared to number of lots. So you change the ratio between them and that will already give you a, a big performance boost for AI. Yes, it's a, it's a good path to follow. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then one can imagine to, you know, start customizing your LUTs, customizing your DSPs, adding eventually more uh, hard IPs and hard macros to handle, um, you know, sigmoid functions or whatever that is, right? You could imagine to create specialized blocks inside of your fabric for, for specific uh, applications that are important to you. Okay, thank you very much, Pierre, for your talk. Nice talk. Now, card is there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very welcome. So, uh, thank you very much, Pierre Emmanuel, for this very nice talk in a very exciting subject. And uh, congratulations for uh, your work uh, related to FPGA. FPGA. Uh, thank you also, Fernando Moraes, for chairing the session. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Ricardo. <laughs>